sexual abuse, um, you know, the, the, the things that have, have swept like, under the carpet. Swept under the carpet, um, you know, and I mentioned that the inquest into Hannah Clark's death and how you can still present to the powers that be and it not be taken seriously enough because we don't talk about it enough. It, it only comes up when something really bad happens. Yeah, um, and one woman a week dies and there are 14 women dead this year already and it's only three months into the year. It's crazy. And I, I follow Cheryl Lee Moody. Um, yeah. who's a journalist for News Limited, but she's got this Red Heart campaign where she documents the deaths of ever, anyone killed by men, so men, women and children. And uh, I, I love how she always writes a story about the person who has been killed because you then go, why, why, are we, why are the police not listening to the story? Why is the, the, the legal system not listening to the stories? They just want the facts. But can, the facts can we, can't exist. Yeah, can can I say because the legal system is stuffed. Oh, yeah. That's the polite way of saying it. It needs to be rehashed and it, there's a lot of things that need to change in it to make things more supportive and stop making people who are, are really wanting help that don't get it and then it's too late because they're dead um, to share their story and say I need help I need protection and there are so many people out there that do and they're just swept under the carpet and isn't it I speak to people like that it's it's it, it breaks my heart and then you've got people like Rose Batty and yes. Grace Tame who bravely share their story all the time and I imagine and they still get judged yeah and, but the I, the, the bravery in sharing something that traumatic continues, you know, you live in that trauma. Um, and, yeah, I can't understand people who have a go at them because they're trying to normalise. Oh, I mean, have no, you can't normalise, you know, rape they're, No, no, they're assault, trying to share their They're normalising the experience of the person who has been a victim of it. So they're not just a number. They're not just, you know, some headline that the newspapers are going, oh, look how horrible this is, is that they're real people. And for us to recognise the signs, you know, so like one of the stories in my book is about my, my first relationship. I had a great teacher from my mum, so I picked a man who was like totally inappropriate and on the outside was charming and wonderful and, you know, swooped me off my feet. And then I lived with him for five years and he did horrible things to me. But everyone thought we were a really happy couple. So this is like the late 80s, early 90s. And it wasn't until I wrote my book that I went, that was domestic violence, isn't it? Like, sh surely that was going on then. Why weren't we talking about it then? And why do I still need to say to people, oh, I'm just giving you a trigger? Like, we people are being triggered because we're not talking about it enough. Oh, so much, so much so. And you know, through COVID in the last two years, domestic violence has risen and people are just, my heart's go out to them and, you know, they were locked behind these doors. They weren't allowed out. The kids couldn't go to school to get a bit of freedom. The, 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 the couple was stuck under each other's feet and, and, oh my God, it just scares me, all these sorts of things. But Going back to you and to your book and to to you and your weight, yes, there was part of it which was a health issue with your thyroid is where it started and endometriosis and all that sort of thing. But the stresses of growing up would have assisted in those things happening to you as far as health goes because if we live with dis-ease, we normally create disease. And, you know, we can look at our outside environments and, and, you know, bring them into our lives. But what we need to be able to do is look from within and work on who we are as a person and not be influenced by all the trauma and the tragedy and things that go on. 
outside our lives. Show empathy, be concerned. There's a lot of things that go on and you can't do anything about. There might be certain things. You might know somebody who you can, you know, have that conversation with and talk to them because they then can feel heard and know someone understands them and, and they can learn to trust. I asked a lady one day, I said, what do you want? And she said, what do you mean, what do I want? She said, I've never been asked what I want. And she'd oh gone through God. 34 years of domestic violence. How, that's, isn't that mind boggling? And I think that was my mum. My mum, I don't think my mum would have ever been asked what she wanted. Mm. Mm. And it was she, never, it was fear. Fear, total fear. And she just perpetuated the same mistakes over and over again because she just didn't know anything different. And there was no one really guiding her. And because she's a baby boomer, you didn't share that stuff. You know, I'm yeah. really grateful that we've broke, we're breaking through the barriers. That, yeah, and that we're talking, you know, we're sitting here talking about very personal things, and it's a good thing. It's like, you know, I've lost my train of thought, but it's it's you know, looking at and listening to people and saying, okay, let's get the right help for you. Let's support you. I don't know what to do, but I'll ask someone if they know someone who can help you or mm. if they know someone who knows someone who can help you. And I'm doing something like that right at this stage. And it's really interesting to, to see because when I have these conversations here, you know, those people want to have a conversation outside there and talk about things and it's really interesting to look at that's what I wanted to say you grew up and saw your mother live in those sorts of situations and you took yourself into a situation like that without being aware yeah and that's what young girls do if they live in those situations in in domestic violence situations they know no different they see no difference so they go into relationships that are the same and until you break that cycle, and that cycle needs to be broken in school, it needs to be taught from prep all the way through school so that people, young kids can understand what a good behaviour is, what a not good behaviour is. And they can say, I don't like that. I'm going to report you. This is not right. You can't do that. No, no, no. Yeah, no, such an important word, isn't it? Not when your mother's telling you to have a shower. That's not the right time for no. <laughs> but, but yeah, to be, you know, like a, oh, I was probably 17 when a very, very famous person, I sat next to a couch and decided he'd stick his hand up my leg, between my legs. And I remember I was 17, I was on work experience and I'm like, I was frozen. And the only reason he moved his hand was because someone looked over and then I slapped his hand away. And it was like, I, I look back and I think, why didn't I get up and move? Why didn't I say no? Why didn't I? Because this person was in a position of power. Uh -huh. and, it's, and it's like, oh, where have I learned that not at the 50 year old me as she's written this, it's not in the book because I didn't formally accuse the person. And my lawyer says that I can't put that in there, even though he did it and he was a creep. Yeah, but it did teach me that a lot of the things that happened to, in my life was because I didn't know how to say no because I was yep. raised as a young girl through the 70s and 80s and my job was to say yes, I to will please do that. people, conform. Yes, and smile and kiss old men that I didn't want to just because they were great uncle somebody um, or to you know, let some drunken editor at a newspaper scream at me because he's had a liquid lunch and everybody just sits there and watches it happen. You know, it's like now nobody would dare do anything to me because I tell you what. <laughs> You'd be like that young kid. You grabbed his hair and pulled him down. Absolutely. They, they, like I was, I was at a party a few years ago and, a you know, a couple were there and, He's gone, yeah, we've got to go now. And I've gone, oh, okay, well, we, we, we can drop her home. And she's gone, oh, yeah, I'd love to stay. And I watched him grab her arm and squeeze, like, so, so tight. I saw her wince. 
And I looked at him and I went, really? And he let go and he moved away. And I went, I don't know whether I made that worse or better, but I thought there was no way he was going to do that. And he just go, I'm just going to ignore this. And, yeah, he's really nice to me now. Because <laughs> he knows you're not going to put up with that crap. He knows I know. Yeah. And that's the whole thing. When they know you know, how many more people are going to know they can't do what they want to do as much as they'd like to. And that's talking about it. It's what we're doing now, talking about it. So it's interesting. So looking at, at, at your life, got growing up as a young girl and the things that happened to you along the way could have created the disease that create the disease that created some of the issues that you've had in your life. But now you're turning those around to make the changes and hopefully share that and help others. I hope do the so. Same, do the same thing. I and hope that, so. Yeah. I, look, I, I'm, it's, it's interesting when you start sharing, you know, things that go on in your head. And look, I've never been shy about my opinion but it would be within the, you know, trusted confines of friends or family, you know, people I felt safe with. You know, maybe I pushed back with authority a little bit. Just ask Tony Abbott how many letters he got from me in the early 90s. There was a lot. Um, but when you start sharing your story and people are like, oh, you're so inspirational, and it's like, well, that's really nice. It's nice to know that I'm inspiring, but it's not why I'm doing it to be inspired. Like it's about me, but it's not about me. It's about just, try, working on making change. I just feel so strongly about storytelling and the opportunities that we have to change people's lives by being a little more open with ours. Is that one, you know, it, our youngest son, some of you have met him today, Quinn, um, has autism and I've, I've written a lot about Quinn's journey through school and the number of people who've written to me privately to say thank you I don't feel like I'm alone anymore yeah. and I'll go you're welcome why don't you share your story as well because then it's just not me talking it's you and me and then you might inspire and another others parent. others and you know what there was a shame about that once upon a time but now you know, I've got a friend who's got two children and I've got ADHD on the spectrums. And, you know, it, it's like, wow, you know, they're full-time, hard work sometimes. And if we don't understand it, we can make judgments which are wrong. So therefore it needs to be spoken about. It needs to be shared. It needs to, people need to understand what you're going through, what, what your child's going through, what you're going through, how you have to work through the processes. So it needs to be spoken about. The conversation has to be there. That's another conversation we're going to have. Yeah, well, autism is a very interesting conversation. Yeah. Maybe Quinn could join in. Absolutely. His perspective on the school system is, you know, and as I said to the Queensland Education Minister's policy advisor is, why are you talking to him? Why are you talking to me? He's the kid who's being mistreated by your school system. Ask him what he needs. Mm. It didn't happen. Okay. That's another story and we can, we can share that as well. Now, what would you say to anyone, any of the listeners out there, about if they were, you know, ill-treated, and have gone through life and kind of accepted that's their lot in life, but it's not really. Or they've they've had an issue with a, an illness or something, but they couldn't get the right diagnosis. What would you suggest that they do? Go find another doctor. Go find somebody else. Not to get the answer that you want but to get somebody who was prepared to go deeper with you. Um, you know, these are the people who will look you in the eye when they're talking to you, like, you know, my doctor did, who actually turned her chair so that we were face-to-face -face and eye-to-eye. -eye. Um, you know, th these are the people who will dig a little bit deeper, who don't just want to know, well, why are you here? 
they want to know the the depth of why you're there how are you feeling what's happening for you and don't stop until you do it's incredibly frustrating and it's time consuming sometimes it's very expensive um, and sometimes it's heartbreaking but when you find that person and, and I believe that you will then your life can change because you've got somebody who can be on the journey with you because then you don't feel alone. You know, and I think the same goes, you know, if, if you're struggling with, with anything, you know, it, it could be something, you know, in the moment or it could be something that affects you in the longer term, is that pick up the phone and ring someone or, or message them and say, I really need to talk. Do you have half an hour? Like, and if that's me, it's like, got a very busy but I always go you know what I'll find a time I'll move something I'll move a mountain if I know that you really need to talk and get something off your chest because we can't just do it all through text messaging and, and yeah. Facebook messaging we, we need to pick up the phone and talk so don't stop until someone says okay how can I help you don't be afraid to ask Indeed. Uh, if you don't, as I say to my kids, if you don't ask, you don't get. Absolutely. So true.